Thanks to the, the beautiful JCC uh, and BCH for putting on these lectures. Uh, these are a great opportunity, especially during the pandemic, for patients to get really great information from providers. Um, and this topic I know is going to be near and dear to um, a lot of people's experiences, whether it be in themselves or with a family member, as we'll talk about these problems with the bladder and incontinence and pelvic floor issues are very, very common um, and something that will touch most people's lives um, in due time. So uh, indeed, I am a OBGYN doc uh, here at Boulder Community Health. Um, I practice at Boulder Women's Care. We are a group of OBGYN physicians. We, we and I do deliver babies uh, here in Boulder. And on the GYN side of, of my job, I have developed certainly a special interest in these problems of the pelvic floor, pelvic floor dysfunction, prolapse, bladder problems. Uh, and it's become really a passion of mine to try to um, really spread information to the public about these problems, because as I said, they're very, very common and really, really undertreated. Um, and there's not nearly enough physicians around to help with these problems, so I really appreciate people tuning in. I don't have any financial disclosures. Uh, in terms of agenda for what we'll talk about here today, we'll describe briefly the general umbrella term of pelvic floor dysfunction. You know, what is the pelvic floor? What are these problems that arise from it? Um, and to talk specifically about two problems, uh, you know, very much related to the bladder um, and urinary issues, but I also do want to talk about prolapse, and that might be a term that a lot of you are familiar with, have heard about, maybe not for other people. It's very intimately connected with urinary incontinence, and so it's a really important thing to discuss at the same time. There are definitely other issues that are related to the pelvic floor that we won't talk about tonight, but that can certainly take up their own lecture, which include problems with bowel movements and bowel movement issues, and also this idea of pain, either acute or chronic pain in women can, can originate from problems from the pelvic floor and be treated um, by coming to see us in the office. So. For each of these problems that we'll go through, I just want to kind of at a very high level describe who's at risk for these things, how do they show up in real life, and what do patients say when they come to see me in the office in terms of what's going on, and then also what are the treatments. And you know, I, I just want to reassure you all listening, just like I do to patients that come in and see me in the office, that the first thing that we will talk about is not surgery, and I hope it's something that we never talk about or talk about as an absolute last resort. I think that's an approach that all surgeons should have towards problems. And I am happy to say and happy to reassure you that there are many great, great, effective, conservative treatments that patients can do on their own far before we ever talk about something like a surgery. So I really encourage everyone to, if you're having some of these issues, to dig into this as you are. Come in and talk to me, because we can talk about a lot of things that are not scary trips to the operating room. So that's just a disclaimer up front. So indeed, these problems all come from the pelvic floor. What, what on earth is the pelvic floor? I think a lot of us have intermittently heard about that over the course of our lives. This bowl of muscles, ligaments, that kind of hold all of our pelvic organs. And I say our men, indeed, have a pelvic floor as well. It doesn't cause nearly as many problems as the female pelvic floor does. Um, but it is a complicated system of muscles that kind of hold a lot of things in the right place and allow them to function correctly. One definition that I think works is that these are pelvic floor dysfunction are symptoms that arise out of weakness and maybe not weakness, but tightness or spasm, or maybe a little bit of both, leading to some amount of discoordination of these structures that make up the quote unquote pelvic floor, which is a complex association of muscles, the connective tissues that anchor those muscles to the pelvis, to your bony pelvis, and then the organs that they hold in place. And without going into it too much at all, it, it is indeed complicated. And the problems that come out of this are complicated and nuanced. And you know, I think when we assume that some of these things can just be fixed with 
drinking a little less water, a little less coffee, or doing your Kegels, I, that's partially true, but there's just a lot more to it. These are, these are complicated problems with, with real but, but nuanced solutions. So just a couple facts about the, the issue at large. Pelvic floor dysfunction in terms of who it affects, one in four women uh, is, is definitely true on a large scale. This little factoid of 50% of women over 50, 60% of women over 60, 70% of women over 70, dealing with some very legitimate part of pelvic floor dysfunction or incontinence is absolutely true. So if you just take a second with that, that's an awful lot of people uh, and, and increasing with age indeed. And so this is something that I, I one, one goal of these talks for me is to absolutely just try to normalize this a little bit. You know, it, it doesn't mean that it's not completely frustrating and embarrassing and time consuming and anxiety provoking, but it is something that is so, so common for one. And number two, it is something that we can fix. I mean, that is the truth and we have a lot of good solutions for it. So one thing is just that it's very, very common and you should know that. The most common facet of, of this, these pelvic floor problems is stress incontinence, that type of leaking we'll talk about with laughing, coughing, sneezing, and feeling like you're not strong enough to hold urine back. But one in three of those women who have urinary incontinence will also have some degree of issues with bowel movements or incontinence of stool or gas, just a whole other category of problems which people definitely also don't want to talk about and completely wish they didn't have also very, very treatable and tied into the same problem, comes from the same dysfunction. At least 60% of nursing home occupants suffer from daily fecal or urinary incontinence. And impressively, I think, a 20% overall lifetime risk of any woman needing surgery for prolapse or incontinence in her life, which is a huge, huge number. And surgical repair of prolapse is the most common surgery that is going on for women over 70. And thousands and thousands of dollars spent every year on pads and other products, as I'm sure many of our listeners can attest to. So to say it again, these issues are very common, and many people are suffering silently with them. Uh, it, as I said, very undertreated, not nearly enough physicians, and I, I talked to most of the patients I talk to, and I 100% understand where this comes from, will tell me that, yes, I've been dealing with this for a long time, and either didn't know there was help to be had for it, or just you know didn't want to come in for it, which all of which I really understand. And so I hear statements like these all the time, and, and many more. So I've had these symptoms for years, but didn't really know there was anything to do about them. I definitely hear that one a lot. Another one very common and also understandable because it is what our culture tells women every day. I get it. I had a couple kids. I assume that some of this was just part of the deal. And that is unfair that that's a message that is sent to women. Uh, and it is not true. It is not part of the deal and does not need to be. Um, and another one, I enjoy sex with my partner, but honestly, it is a little painful most of the time, and it has been that way for years. So, you know, these, these problems, they take a lot from women, you know, in a lot of different spheres of their life, their intimate relationships with their partner, their ability to exercise and maintain a, their own vitality and energy, uh, just a million different little places where this shows up, um, which really takes a toll over the course of time. So in terms of there, there are, these are kind of four broad issues that can be lumped into pelvic floor dysfunction. We are going to tonight talk about two uh, because they are the most related to the, the theme of this talk, which is, which is urinary incontinence. So we are going to start with prolapse. And I want to start by showing a video that describes this idea of prolapse, which just to talk about it is the idea that somehow the support of your pelvic floor has become weak over time and allowed your pelvic organs to kind of sink down, fall down into the vagina, kind of fall out of their normal place. 
especially with activity. So this is something that some listeners will be very connected to and know that they have some sort of a problem with this. Other people may have never heard of this term before of prolapse, but it's really helpful to, I think, watch this video, which I hope doesn't scare people too much, uh, to get some idea of what we're talking about. The vagina can be separated into three different sections or compartments, anterior or front, posterior or back, and central or top. Normal support of each vaginal section contributes to the support of other organs. Note that the vagina is bordered by the bladder, rectum, and uterus at each of the sections. Loss of support of the front or anterior vaginal compartment can result in the bladder descending or falling into the vaginal canal and sometimes through the vaginal opening. This is also known as cystocele. Similarly, loss of support of the back or posterior vaginal compartment can result in the displacement of the rectum into the vaginal canal and sometimes through the vaginal opening. This is also known as rectocele. Lastly, loss of support of the top or central compartment of the vagina can lead to a downward displacement of the cervix and uterus into the vaginal canal or through the vaginal opening. This is called uterovaginal prolapse. Women who have had their uterus removed in a surgery called a hysterectomy can also experience loss of support of the top compartment of the vagina. This is known as post-hysterectomy vaginal fault prolapse. In these cases, So I recognize that might be a little <laughs> daunting to watch that video. Uh, I, I don't want to send the message that anyone tuning into this who's having bladder leaking has prolapse. That is not, not necessarily the case. But a lack of support underneath the bladder, a lack of strength of your pelvic floor muscles around the bladder is, is definitely involved with urinary incontinence. And they, it is tightly tied to this idea of prolapse. And so one, one valuable aspect of coming in to see a doctor like me in the clinic is that not only do you get a good chance to tell your whole story to someone who has heard it before and and can empathize with what's going on and can offer a lot of treatments for it. But it is, it is prolapse and, and the degree to which you're lacking support in your pelvic floor is something that's very difficult for patients to know on their own. Bulges, as we'll talk about, they start small and progress very slowly. And you can have a, a fairly significant lack of support that's really affecting your bladder that, that you would not otherwise particularly know about or it wouldn't be very obvious to you. So I, I don't want that to sound too concerning, but I just want to relate that like, it is important to think about support and prolapse when we talk about bladder problems, which I know is why people are tuning in today. So this slide, again, just reviews those. There are three prominent types of prolapse bulges that occur. And that upper left slide refers to normal. And it certainly always takes a moment to stare at these pelvis pictures for a second to understand at least what normal is. And then with each of these three bulges, there are indeed three different areas where we can lose support and have something bulge down. By far the most common, and the one that's related to this talk the most, is the upper right, which is where the bladder, the support underneath the bladder becomes weak over time. And when patients bear down, the bladder is able to prolapse down into the vagina, forming a bulge, and really bringing the bladder way out of its normal position. The bladder is a very sensitive organ. It doesn't like that at all, and so it gives rise to a bunch of urinary issues. So that idea, which is colloquially called your bladder falling down, we call a cystocele. A second and less common type of prolapse is in the bottom left, and that's where the support overlying the rectum on the bottom floor of the vagina becomes weak. And with straining, with bowel movements, the rectum is allowed to bulge up into the vagina, causing a kind of similar but opposite problem that's called a rectocele that goes along with a lot of bowel movement issues and complaints. And then the third type, uterine prolapse, is also quite common. And that refers to the fact that there are some separate support structures that are responsible for holding the uterus up high in the pelvis. 
And just like all these other ligaments in our bodies can, and muscles can become weak over time, the uterus can be allowed to prolapse down into the vagina too. So to get into this framework, prolapse, so who is at risk for this? When we think about prolapse, what this comes down to in my mind is a, a competition of two forces. So you have your pelvic floor, which is responsible for holding an awful lot up in our lives, in our daily lives. And there are pressures, any pressures from above that push down on your pelvic floor over the course of time will weaken it and cause prolapse to happen. So those forces are working in one direction, which is downward. And then what we can be a part of is strengthening our pelvic floor and strengthening those muscles so that we have forces working in the opposite direction to oppose all those daily downward forces. So these risk factors for prolapse all relate to this idea of what pushes down on our pelvic floors every day. And some of these things, as I describe here, we have control over, and some of them we don't. And so just to talk about the ones that we don't, first of all, perhaps, are age. Haven't figured out how to do much about that. Second is our children. Blessings that they are, we can't give them back. And they are indeed related to prolapse. And having had pelvic surgery in the past has been really unclear if that does relate to a woman's future risk of having vaginal vault prolapse, which was the last uh, video that was described there. So just to talk about those briefly, age is absolutely, it really is the number one risk factor for developing pelvic floor weakness and prolapse. Just the number increasing increases your risk, but menopause on its own is a really critical aspect of prolapse because primarily due to lack of estrogen. And this, this is a conversation that goes on with men, older men a little bit about declining testosterone levels and their inability to keep their muscles strong. And the same thing happens to women when estrogen drops off with menopause, is that their ability to grow and maintain muscle mass and strength is really diminished when estrogen is not around. And thus, we see the incidence of pelvic floor problems absolutely skyrocket when women go through menopause. And so for both those, just time on planet Earth and the incidence of menopause are, is, are both reasons why age is really important. Pregnancies are indeed important. It is, it is not correct to say that this is always related to babies, which is a common point of discussion. That, that is not true. I do see an awful lot of women who have developed prolapse and pelvic floor problems who have never been pregnant before. It can definitely, definitely happen. But it is true that a pregnancy, 40 weeks of carrying that baby, uh, is, is challenging on your pelvic floor, and then certainly delivery, no matter how you deliver, can be challenging for your pelvic floor as well. So it is true within that, the vaginal delivery, at least as it relates to pelvic floor dysfunction and urinary incontinence and risk for prolapse, it is that those things are more connected to vaginal delivery than they are the delivering by C-section. But it is true that C-section, being pregnant and delivering by C-section on its own does also increase your risk for these problems, which just points to the fact that pregnancy is very challenging on the pelvic floor. Um, what ones do we have control over? So this, this is really what I think is the most important thing to talk about. We will talk about it again when we get to the treatment of these problems, but you know, these, these things that we can control, we should. And this is a conversation that I have with patients who have these issues and we're sitting there together. It's a conversation to have with anyone who's curious about how to protect themselves from having these things happen later. You know, this, these ideas are the same. And so number one on this list is obesity. And it is, I think it makes sense to people that the more weight that we carry, the more that weight is pressing down on our pelvic floors every day of our lives. So, that is, you know, I don't wag my finger about weight all the time because I don't like it when doctors do that to me. But it is a true, true thing to say that your weight is very closely connected to prolapse. It's very closely connected to every type of bladder dysfunction and, and urinary incontinence that we're going to talk about. The bladder does not like to be pushed down upon and really gives rise to a lot of these problems. And, and more weight that we carry does do that. Number two, very, very important is that are increasingly, and especially during the pandemic, although none of us wish it was true, sedentary lifestyles 
Our pelvic floor is a very core integrated part of our, of our, of our core, of the deepest nature of our core. And it is definitely correct to think about our fitness in, in terms of our entire body, doing the things we love to do, hiking, walking, whatever. And if your body is fit, by definition, you are keeping your pelvic floor fit because th this entire system is really an ecosystem. And, and when it, I have unfortunately just seen it an awful lot over the course of the past two years that when women have been robbed of their usual exercise routine with being stuck inside and can't go to the gym and and just something even small changes about their physical activity level and their overall level of fitness and vitality, these problems can start to show up very quickly. And it is unfair, but it is indeed true. Two other really common discrete reasons that women strain on a daily basis that definitely leads to prolapse. Chronic constipation is, is, is a big problem in this conversation. And it's a big problem that's very difficult to tackle. And, and anyone who has chronic constipation who has struggled with this knows about that. It is, to, some, to people that don't have it, it seems like it should be easy to fix. But it can be really, really challenging. And straining with bowel movements every day of your life is definitely a risk factor for prolapse, as is chronic cough, whether that goes along with pulmonary disease or smoking. So for prolapse, how does it present itself? What are, what are women feeling at home? What are they talking to me about in the clinic? There's really two aspects to this. One is one possibility, one category of, of symptoms is just feeling a bulge, the, the physicality of the bulge. There's a bulge there, I can feel it. Or there's something in the vagina, I can feel it. You know, some women describe these very like specific and obviously abnormal feelings. Like it feels like I have a tampon in the vagina, but I don't. You know, it feels like something is there that's not supposed to be. And it's, it's not always very obvious to them what it is. And sometimes it can be much more vague than that, just a sense of vaginal fullness, of pressure, of vaginal pain. Um, those, that is definitely true of bulges that are, that are starting out and just starting to grow. And then certainly once prolapse becomes more advanced and those bulges reach the vaginal opening and, and beyond, you can imagine that they start to have a lot more really obvious symptoms. That, the, that tissue rubs on underwear. It's difficult to sit. It's difficult to even go to the bathroom in a normal way when things have just really moved out of their normal location. So that kind of dovetails into the second category. So one is just feeling a bulge. The second category is that invariably, there will be some amount of symptoms that come from the organ that is behind the bulge, that is prolapsing. And so for cystocele, when, when bladder is the thing that's falling down, the symptoms that can go along with that are stress incontinence or urge incontinence. We're going to talk about both of those explicitly. Frequency, just peeing a, a seemingly a million times throughout the day. You need to plan your whole life around peeing and got to pee before you leave and right during the thing and then twice in the grocery store when you get back. Double voiding in terms of, this is also kind of like incompletely emptying your bladder, sitting down to pee, thinking that you did Fine, standing up, realizing you need to sit back down and go again, the, the bladder not emptying completely. Splinting is a term that goes along with the bladder and the bowel. This is something that patients think is absolutely unbelievable that they have to do this, but I can tell you that it, it happens so much that there's a name for it, which is called splinting, which is that if the bladder has fallen down to a certain degree, some women just find that if they push it back up a little bit, they can pee normally. And the same thing can happen with erectoseal, that if you push the bulge back down, However you figure it out, then things work a little bit better. Having a weak or a changing stream, and also feeling that you need to pee almost uncontrollably during intercourse are all symptoms of your, of your bladder kind of being pushed on. And then as far as rectocele goes, having just mechanically difficult bowel movements when that did not used to be a problem for you, um, splinting indeed with, with rectoceles, Stool trapping, feeling like you're, some of this is going normally, but you just can't get other stool out. Like it feels like it's getting trapped somewhere, that there's a cul-de-sac that is just not right. It's a very common complaint with this. And then accidental bowel leakage, fecal incontinence, whether that's of liquid stool, solid stool, or just gas, is, is also very common and, and very fixable. Like I just want to reassure people, like th that's a terrible problem to have, and, and we can get on top of that and also the feeling of needing to have a bowel movement during intercourse. So we're going to move on to, to just talk about bladder leaking. 
because I know that's what a lot of people are interested in. And just to keep in mind, this idea of cystocele is the one that's behind that. And so just to, to zoom in on bladder issues now, when, just when I see patients in the clinic and we're talking about bladder issues, they, they really come in these large categories and we're gonna focus specifically on the first two. So one big, awful big category is urinary incontinence, that we're having some amount of leaking, maybe it's rare, maybe it's all the time, maybe it's with certain activities, maybe it's, we can't figure out why on earth it's happening. But urinary incontinence is one. Another category is, is termed overactive bladder with an umbrella term. That refers to a bladder that is, it's indeed overactive, it doesn't behave itself very well. We seem to have to go to the bathroom all the time and that we can hardly drink anything without needing to go to the bathroom again. So that does relate to frequency during the day. Urgency, bladder spasms, these like, oh, oh my gosh, I gotta get to the bathroom and I can't get there fast enough. Whether or not that leads to an accident or not, just having that experience of urgency. And also, nocturia is the, is the clinical term for needing to get up multiple times throughout the night to go to the bathroom. It's related to the same problem. And it, as anyone knows, who even has to get up you know, twice during the night, majorly disruptive to your sleep. And I think the world is appreciating more and more how important, consistent, good, deep sleep is to our overall health and well-being. And it is, it is true in ways that I think it's difficult for us even to appreciate that getting up three, four, five times at night to pee, even if you feel like you get back to bed okay afterwards, which a lot of people don't, is very fragmenting to your rest and, and has a lot of downstream consequences. And so nocturia, I think, is a really, really underappreciated problem with overactive bladder. Urinary retention is related to double voiding or incomplete emptying, this idea that you are going to the bathroom and, and either knowingly or unknowingly you're not emptying your bladder completely and always retaining some urine. That is a setup to get recurrent UTIs, which is the next item on the list. UTIs are urinary tract infections or bladder infections. And then also just this idea of bladder pain. So to talk specifically about incontinence, these first two, stress incontinence and urge incontinence, are the ones that I, I think people may have heard more about. And they're certainly the two that are the most common that I ask about in clinic. So the third, just to say it, overflow incontinence is something that is certainly a little bit more rare in the world. That usually arises due to neurologic conditions or neurologic insults to one's bladder where someone can't really appreciate that their bladder is getting full and it gets fuller and fuller without them really particularly knowing that they need to go to the bathroom. And essentially, the tank becomes completely full and urine leaks out because we are just overflowing. There is nothing else to do. And so that is a condition that can arise due to poorly treated diabetes, um, other spinal cord injuries that affect our, our, literally our nervous system's ability to feel our bladders. So those are, those are quite pathological conditions and they're ultimately a little bit rare but very important to identify if they are going on. The first two, far more common. And so anytime that I'm just sitting down with someone and we're talking about urinary incontinence, I'm always trying to elucidate which one of these two things is going on. And they, they can sound similar sometimes. They can overlap and occur within the same person. But they, the reasons that they are happening are different. The treatments for them are different. And so it's important for me to try to ask the right questions to figure out which one is the bigger problem for you. And it, indeed, it might be both, but we're trying to figure out which one is more predominant. And so stress incontinence, first, I do think is the one that more people have heard about in the world. And so that is the idea that somehow our muscles are not strong enough to hold back urine when we laugh, cough, sneeze, jump up and down, walk up a flight of stairs, go to an exercise class, all of the above. Um, and and I, you know, I, that obviously is a pretty common story, unfortunately, and it's one that patients are connected to. They, these events are, are embarrassing and extremely frustrating and, 
and is, this is a big category that keeps people away from exercising, and then they really get to be less fit, and they put on a little bit of weight, and then these problems get worse, and they cycle on themselves, which is a very common and unfortunate situation that happens with this. But that, so that's what stress incontinence is. Urge incontinence is, it is a situation where your bladder muscle is spazzy and it, it's overactive. Urge incontinence is really kind of under this umbrella of overactive bladder. And indeed, you can be sitting there doing absolutely nothing and someone turns on the faucet and the urge to go to the bathroom hits you so quickly that you just can't get to the bathroom fast enough or at least you're, you're running. So that can also happen in other areas of your life where your brain seems to get the message that we're going to be able to pee soon or you're anxious about being able to pee and then the need to go is immediate. It's an exceedingly common story that someone will tell me that they seem to always get into this predicament when they just get home from running errands and they're just getting their keys in the door to get inside the house and somehow their brain knows they're going to be able to pee soon but they're not quite there yet and they have this tremendous urgency or accidents because the system is not communicating. So that sort of urgency, bladder spasm, overactive bladder is what urge incontinence is all about. And to say nothing about a complicated slide, I just want to communicate that this is, this is a complicated problem. Part of this reflex in terms of how we just void normally is it indeed is voluntary. And then there's a whole other set of reflexes and concentric and reflexive relaxations and contractions that need to happen just to pee normally. You know, how, how frustrating that the littlest things are actually so complicated. And there are solutions and places to intervene all over the place within this. And, 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 and different people will have different problems at different areas. So to be quite specific about stress incontinence, so who does this show up for? And a lot of this information will seem redundant uh, as we go through it, which is, which is good to some degree because that means these solutions will solve many problems at once. But obesity is, is as tied into stress and incontinence as it is to anything else we will talk about tonight. And, it, and, and as I was saying, it is the thing that is the most impacted by weight loss, stress incontinence. And there are many studies suggesting that, that weight loss surgery, which is not what I want everyone to have right away, um, does show dramatic improvements in stress incontinence just from losing weight and not changing anything else. So that just tells us, one of many things that tells us, that weight is very connected to stress incontinence. Because stress incontinence is, is very, very directly a muscle strength issue, these sphincters are not squeezing hard enough, something is wrong with the muscles. That really ties into this sedentary lifestyle, deconditioning, not as fit in a whole body way as we used to be. Pregnancies, absolutely connected to stress incontinence, vaginal delivery more than C-section, age and menopause, menopause, lack of estrogen, lack of muscle strength and ability to build muscle. And then indeed having prolapse or having a weak pelvic floor is also a risk factor. And we've talked about it. How does this present itself? Leaking with cough, sneeze, laugh, exercise. Some other stories that are just common that I hear a lot that one might not connect to what we hear about stress incontinence in, in the public is this idea of like small, constant, insensible loss of urine when we're just exercising or moving and not, almost being unaware of that it's happening, just always feeling kind of wet. And which is very annoying to have happen, but that, that is very often a stress incontinence kind of pathology. And some other symptoms that are kind of red flags for us um, are the situation where you have a large volume of uncontrollable loss of urine, where it's just like the whole bladder just decides to empty itself all of a sudden. Um, waking up, having wet the bed is enuresis, that is the clinical term for that, or any incontinence with sexual intercourse. So I want to go through those same things with urge incontinence, just to give the whole picture. And this particular graphic kind of talks about this idea, of this umbrella term of OAB, overactive bladder, and the fact that there are a lot of things that live within that, because it's all related to a bladder that is indeed overactive. Frequency throughout the day, getting up many times to pee at night is one thing. 
having bladder spasms and urgency and just always being, always thinking about your bladder nonstop is another. And then actually having accidents related to that urgency is also within the same thing. So risk factors for urge incontinence, obesity is in, again, first on the list. Uh, secondly, something that's very particular and very important to talk about with urgency in overactive bladder is bladder irritants. And I think well, I, the next slide talks about this a little bit more, but this idea that caffeine and sugar and artificial sweeteners that we should drink less of them because they are nicer to our bladder is frustrating counseling to hear from your doctor, but it is absolutely the truth, and these have a huge, huge impact on frequency and urgency. Um, having prolapse a bladder that is lacking support is, is almost guaranteed to have some degree of urgency. The bladder does not like to be out of position like that, and so it gets overactive. Uh, there is a much stronger family history component to overactive bladder and urgency than there is to anything else we'll talk about. They do these very interesting twin studies that show that among tw identical twins that there is a much higher correlation but with everyone experiencing urge incontinence, whereas that is not necessarily the case at all for stress incontinence. So family history is interesting for urgency. Recurrent UTIs, uh, having it is an insult, even in a small way, to the bladder to get bladder infections over and over and over again, to have the bladder be inflamed and then healed, and then inflamed and then healed again. That is. It is a situation that is asking for those, the nerves of the bladder to get hyperactive. And so recurrent UTIs is indeed a risk factor. And the last two here, having a hypertonic or a tight pelvic floor, as opposed to a weak pelvic floor, a tight pelvic floor, and how that idea dovetails into how we carry anxiety in our bodies, I think is very real, very under-discussed in the topic of pelvic floor dysfunction and especially overactive bladder, and something that I think really deserves a lot more discussion amongst everyone. And this idea, just very briefly, which I think we can all connect to, is that these are anxious times like never before, and I think it's really more common than we realize to think about how we carry anxiety in our bodies you know, somatically, how do we do that? And, you know, I think people are aware that they, they scrunch their shoulders, they scrunch their face, and I think much more than we realize, we clench our pelvic floors, even to small degrees. And this type of, like, chronic clenching uh, is something that can lead to definitely an imbalanced, dysfunctional, tight pelvic floor in certain ways that can have a lot to do with incontinence, both stress incontinence and urgency, actually, but, but definitely urge incontinence. That type of pelvic floor tightness will make a bladder overactive. So just something, I think, fascinating to think about. Um, for presentation, we've talked about this, but urgency shows up with frequency during the day. That can also happen at night. Bladder spasms and urge accidents. And then, and, and bladder pain, there's, a, there's often a lot of urgency and overactive bladder that goes into bladder pain syndromes in patients who seem to have chronic pelvic pain. Because bladder spasms, when you have the strength to hold back urine and you're having a spasm and you're not leaking, but your bladder muscle is just squeezing, is, is uncomfortable. And that can be a sor kind of an unrecognized source of pain. And so I, I do, I give this out to every patient I talk to <laughs> urgency about in the clinic. It is a bummer, I'm sorry about that. Uh, everything on this list is delicious and fun. And the message here is not that you need to cut everything out. But for anyone that has these problems, it is worth a little bit of detective work and curiosity about whether or not any of these things play a reasonable role in your daily, in your daily life. And so, and it, it is more than I think we are taught in terms of, I think people have heard that a pot of coffee every morning is not good for your bladder, in terms of your bladder being overactive specifically. And perhaps you've heard that alcohol does the same thing or have experienced that. But the truth is that I do think caffeine is probably one of the biggest offenders. And you know we should be cognizant of coffee, 
of tea, of iced tea, of the amount of caffeine that's in chocolate, if some people love chocolate, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say second on the list is sugar in, in its many forms. And the reason that some surprising things are on this list, like apples and cranberries, um, is that natural, and, and chocolate, maybe less surprising, but fructose, sucrose, lactose in milk, you know, for some people, much more than you would think, these are bladder irritants and they make your bladder much more spazzy and they, they can sometimes be responsible for a huge proportion of these problems. So I would just invite you to think about this a little bit and take a look. And these experiments don't have to be tortuous. Just take one that plays a larger role and maybe cut it down. Maybe cut it out if you have the strength and give it a couple weeks and see what changes. And if nothing changes, add it back in. You have my blessing. Uh, but I think these are really real, and they make big differences for people. And this is a little bit blurry on the slide, but this, this light bulb tip over here about urgency I think is really interesting. And this talks about a common thing that women with urgency and frequency do, which is restrict their fluid intake so they're not constantly going to the bathroom or they're not worrying about having accidents all the time. And this is really kind of a, a self-perpetuating maneuver because what is true is that when you don't drink enough fluid, your urine is always concentrated. It's always more concentrated than it should be. And I, perhaps even higher on the list than a lot of these things is concentrated urine is a bladder irritant. So then you have more urgency when you're already restricting fluid to deal with your urgency. So um, I just think that's an important piece of information to get out. So we will move on to the treatments. Um, for each of these things, I'll kind of buzz through these because I want to leave, I want to give you the important information but leave time for your questions. And so briefly for each of these big items, we're going to go through what can you do on your own, what are some conservative things that I can offer you when we talk in the clinic, and then are there surgeries, are there procedures that can be more definitive. And so we're just going to go through these to start with prolapse. What are some lifestyle things that we can do about prolapse? These, I think you may have heard the message by now, but by far the best thing you can do for prolapse is one, deal with these forces that are pushing down on your pelvic floor and making your prolapse worse. That is weight loss, that is definitely addressing constipation, and it's about getting the body moving, however feels good to you. But whole body fitness equals pelvic floor fitness, and that is all the same goal and the same success. So, in a lot of ways, we're reducing the ways that we're straining down on the pelvic floor. And then a cornerstone of this entire talk is about how can we make your pelvic floor stronger to resist all that, to, to fix our incontinence, to, to lift prolapse back up. And Kegels, that nebulous age-old term, is one item, but what I will submit to you is that something that is one million times more effective than doing Kegels at home, which I've intermittently done at home too, we all have, and just squeezing everything all at once and then relaxing it, not having any particular idea of why we're doing that or what's going on. Something that is so much more effective than that is to see a physical therapist who has fellowship training, years of training in just this category of pelvic floor weakness who can teach you how to do one of many, many, many different types of Kegel exercises that are right for you, for your specific problem, which are a totally different set of exercises than they would give someone else with a different pelvic floor and incontinence related problem, um, and can make sure you're doing them correctly, because uh, there's, there's just a ton of nuance here that is very difficult, if not impossible, to do on your own. And so I just want to, I'll put in many plugs for pelvic PT. And by doing that, strengthening our pelvic support, improving bowel and bladder function, and then also addressing pain. And so I, I have, BCH has wonderful pelvic floor physical therapists. There are many, many in the community that are very skilled, and I have a long list of those that I can provide to you when we're talking. But this, what these practitioners are able to do is absolutely incredible, and they use many different modalities to help you with these problems. And I would also just reassure you that the experience of going to pelvic PT, which I've been to myself, is not one of like many pelvic exams and stuff like that. 
This is, like all good PT, this is something where they're helping you understand what's going on with your own body, teaching you exercises that you do on your own, and you do the vast majority of this work on your own, outside of the office. And it is so, so great. And as I said before, there are many different muscles to exercise and, and just a lot of really great targets. So prolapse, other conservative things that we can offer in the office. There's really two things on this list. One is one that I want to start with is the idea of, of adding back some amount of estrogen. And so what we're talking about with this is different than hormone replacement therapy and that whole thorny conversation around that, even though we're very, really supportive of hormone replacement therapy and do that for a million patients also. What we're talking about with pelvic floor dysfunction is vaginal estrogen in the form of a cream or a tablet that goes in the vagina, just acts locally where we want it to, really does not get into your bloodstream very much at all, and thus does not carry all these same risks that hormone replacement therapy does, that being the idea of taking an estrogen pill by mouth, putting on a patch, the way that we deal with hot flashes, night sweats, and all the other things that go into that conversation. But adding estrogen just to the vagina twice a week can do a lot to help with this lack of estrogen problem that goes along with our inability to get our muscles to be stronger. So it's a, it is a very safe, very effective adjunct to pelvic PT and trying to heal ourselves. Um, and we are able to use bioidentical forms of estrogen uh, that are affordable and really easy to use. They are not messy. They come with applicators or in suppositories where this is, this is something that can be just twice a week, really easy part of life. And so secondly, another important thing to mention is pessaries. So this is something that pa patients may have heard of over the course of time, but these are indeed have been around for a long time. And they are vaginal inserts that are made out of really soft, flexible silicone. And they indeed come in a lot of different, very funny shapes and sizes. And what we do when we use a pessary to fix prolapse is that we find the one that's right for you. It's the right shape for your prolapse. We are, of course, trying to find the smallest one that works for you. And when this pessary is in, it, you do not feel it. You would forget that it's there for weeks or months at a time. And it is OK to leave these in for longer periods of time. Um, they, when they're in, they hold your body parts back up exactly where they're supposed to be. So functionally, you really don't have prolapse anymore. And your bladder and bowel start acting like that and acting more normal. And so this is something that you can take out on your own and put back in on your own. Or if you don't feel like doing that, you can come into the office and we do it for you. Uh, it, it might sound intimidating, but this is a non-surgical option that can fix prolapse. It can be a lifelong solution. And just can be a lot more manageable than you think. So it's, it's just something that I always offer to patients. And I just can't even count the number of patients that have tried a pessary, found it to be amazingly effective. and and. That was the solution for them. So surgical treatments for prolapse, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but are there surgeries for prolapse? Yes, there absolutely are. And do I want everyone to start with surgery right off the bat? No, I don't. I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that everyone should start with this weight loss and fitness and pelvic floor strengthening to improve what we have organically. And then if those solutions are not enough, then Sure, it's very reasonable to talk about surgery, and I'm happy to say that these surgeries are major life improvers for women that really want and need them. So the type of surgery that someone needs for prolapse certainly depends on the type of prolapse that she has. So if your bladder is falling down, an anterior repair, which is also called a bladder lift, picks the bladder back up and provides support underneath it where it needs to be. A rectocele has a similar fix called a posterior repair, where we push that rectal bulge back down, recreate strength over the top of it, and we're done. If uterine prolapse is a part of the situation, then we do need to do a hysterectomy to address that lack of support. We don't really need to remove ovaries at all, but we do need to remove the uterus and kind of recreate that support at the top of the vagina. And so some important things to say about these surgeries is one, we do not use mesh. There's a lot of discussion about mesh and class action lawsuits about mesh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the best surgeries that are done for these problems, one, they're done vaginally. And so without robots and laparoscopic surgeries, 
We, these are all approached vaginally, so you have no incisions on your belly, and we're using your own connective tissue to reestablish the support that we've lost over time. So no mesh, vaginal procedures. It's very rare that we have a hospital stay that's longer than one night, and some patients can go home the same day. So short hospital stays, and, and indeed we can talk about it, and there are certain many different situations for this, but we, there's no reason that we need to remove anything else other than just what's related to the problem. And a very short explanation of what these surgeries are like is that if you have a bladder that's falling down, you have a bladder bulge, these surgeries are done vaginally. There's one incision over the bulge through that vaginal skin. In that second picture, we're finding that fascia, that endopelvic fascia, and bringing it back together, providing the strong floor underneath the bladder that used to be there. And we're doing that with dissolvable sutures. They're very slow dissolving, but they are dissolvable sutures. So ultimately, nothing is left but your own tissue. And then kind of closing everything back up. So prolapse surgeries are, are many variations on the same idea. So urgency, lifestyle tips for fixing overactive bladder and urgency. Weight loss is a big contributor here. Number two, really getting curious about bladder irritants and looking into that. And then thirdly, Again, more research needs to be done, but this idea of mindfulness and learning how to connect with our pelvic floors and not holding tension down there uh, is fascinating and very real with regard to overactive bladder. And then pelvic PT absolutely has, I think if someone is even aware of pelvic PT, you would think that you're there to make muscles stronger, you're to do Kegels or fancy Kegels. And with urgency, there's often a problem of a tight or of an overactive or an imbalanced pelvic floor. And this idea of learning how to relax your pelvic floor, which is something that no one actually really knows how to do. It's so difficult to feel that. And it's so valuable to have someone teach you how to do that. So down, this, this idea of downtrain to uptrain is to, you need to, we need to learn how to just relax our pelvic floors to get back to normal, to get back to baseline, and then get stronger in a way that stops our incontinence. And so, that's complicated, and it needs a, you need a professional to help you with that. And there's also just some really fascinating modalities with biofeedback that short circuit this apparent brain bladder misfiring that leads to these sorts of bladder spasm accidents. Conservative treatments for urgency. You know, the next step after we've really worked on the lifestyle part and the weight loss and the pelvic PT is a, is medications, and I'm not a particular fan of medications, and I hope most people don't need medications, and no one wants to take another pill every day, but I'm happy to say that there's a pill for this. They're pretty well tolerated. They're usually very affordable, and these do have very specific action on your bladder to make you go less during the day, and particularly to make you go less at night. And they, they do have side effects like most medicines, but for a lot of patients, they're very minimal, and we can dial this in in a way that is a major improvement in your daily life in terms of urgency. So, I, again, I, I, I don't want this to be the, th the first thing and only thing we talk about, which happens way too often with incontinence, but um, these are really valuable. And I'm not gonna talk too much about procedures for urgency. There are a lot of very odd and fascinating things that can be done for an overactive bladder. From a procedural standpoint, if everything else fails, there's a pacemaker you can get for your bladder, which keeps it from firing inappropriately, and a lot of other kind of odd things like that. So stress incontinence. So, and I know this is a big topic that people are interested in. So what lifestyle things are there for stress incontinence? I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but weight loss is extremely important for stress incontinence. Being aware of prolapse if it's there, which I can help you with. I'm, I, I think seeing a clinician that knows how to evaluate for prolapse is, is sometimes the only way to really tell what's going on with prolapse. Addressing constipation, and sometimes just paying more attention to um, your voiding in terms of avoiding diary. And then PT just has an absolutely central role for, for fixing this problem on a lifestyle level. So there's a, there is a muscle weakness problem here with stress incontinence, and, and PT is the best way to address it. For conservative options, there are pessaries that are specifically designed to stop stress incontinence. They provide the type of support that you need underneath your bladder to stop that type of leaking from happening. So there, this is a thing that we can try. There, 
this is especially kind of an interesting thing that comes up for women who just have leaking, maybe during exercise or during a very specific thing, when they're horseback riding or when they're hiking, and not a lot of other times. It can be a thing that might sound weird, but can be majorly effective, is to find a pessary that's very easy to use, that you put in during the activities during which you leak, and then you don't need to wear it the rest of the time. It can be something that you just take to the gym in your gym bag. And they can be great like that and, and be a solution that involves no surgery. I just also want to raise some awareness. There is an over-the-counter product called Poise Impreza um, that is, might seem really odd to first look at, but is really great and is a great thing for women with stress incontinence to at least try to see if these type of solutions are getting in the right ballpark. So Impreza, are, this is function, it is a lot like a tampon. It's made out of very similar material. It has a similar applicator, but it expands in a way that provides that same type of support underneath your bladder in the way that a, a incontinence pessary does. And for some women, when they put these in and then they go exercise or hike, they have no leaking at all. You throw it away afterwards and on with your day. So these are out and around and are very interesting for people to try. So lastly, um, procedures that are there for stress incontinence. There really is, is one primary first line surgical treatment for stress incontinence, which I think if people have, have this problem and they've gotten into this, have heard of this idea of slings or incontinence slings. And so this is an outpatient surgery which has really revolutionized the way that we treat stress incontinence. Stress incontinence used to be addressed surgically with some very involved surgeries that moved the bladder and resupported things all over the place. And what has come to be true is that there is an outpatient surgery where we can use a, a mesh, a type of mesh, and this is a safe use of mesh, which is very different than the rest of the publicity out there about mesh, to, to provide this type of support to stop stress incontinence. And so these are called mid-urethral slings or incontinence slings. And the idea with this very briefly, and this is kind of the last thing I'm gonna talk about and then we'll take some questions, is that with stress incontinence, the problem that we have, if you have the bladder and the urethra going to the outside, we're really lacking support with stress incontinence underneath the urethra. It's this top wall of the vagina that we've lost support there. And what this sling does is it, it kind of gets placed as a hammock underneath the urethra and it provides the type of support that we need. It's the same support that an incontinence pessary provides. It's the same support that Impreza provides. We need to kind of provide support underneath the urethra and the sling provides that. So it is indeed an outpatient surgery. That sling is put in the right place via a one centimeter incision on the top wall of the vagina right underneath the urethra and that's the only incision. It is a thin strip of permanent mesh which is absolutely important to consider and I don't take that lightly. Um, but it's placed in the right area and then you end up going home from the hospital and truly the efficacy of this surgery is, is excellent, is the truth. This Cochrane review with 12,000 women reviewed had a success rate with bothersome stress incontinence of 71 to 97 percent cure rate at one year which was maintained at five years and there's more data to suggest that these slings are effective for really quite a long time. So for such a bothersome, such a common problem, it's absolutely fabulous to have a minimally invasive outpatient surgery that it's a good fix. It is not what everyone should start with, but it is something that's on the table. And there are risks to talk about with slings as there are with all surgeries. I'm happy to say that I think when these are done carefully, these risks are very low, um, but they can happen and we should always talk about them. So that's what I wanted to cover. We're just about out of time. Um, in the future, we will have certainly other talks about these other pelvic floor related issues. Some conclusion statements. One is I just want to drive home that these problems are very common, very undertreated, and very treatable. And within that, the best fixes are the ones that involve no surgery at all and allow you to heal yourself. If you do need a procedure, there are options with quick recovery and excellent success. And lastly, do your Kegels, or better yet, go see a PT. Thank you very much. This is my beautiful wife, Helena. We raise alpacas at our home, and we're now raising a child as my wife is pregnant, and we're due in January. So this is our first, quite an experience to be an obstetrician having your first child, I can tell you that. So thanks for listening. I appreciate you tuning in, and we're going to take some questions. Thank you so much, doctor.
You're we welcome. appreciate all the information. It was yep. very good. Uh, we're just going to run by a couple of questions here and sure. then wrap this up. Yep. So, um, and these are just some uh, random questions. The rest of the audience uh, will get you to uh, reply directly uh, to the doctor after the presentation. So, uh, one of our viewers wanted to know if there are long-term risks associated with using pads to absorb urine from leakage. There, there definitely are, and that, you know, I presume that that patient might already be experiencing this, but this one key reason that I think it's really, other than the obvious and the fact that it's so time consuming and expensive and annoying to use pads all the time and not get to a better solution for this is that, is that urine is very acidic and the tissues on your bottom are, are, do not put up well with being experiencing that all the time. And the answer is yes, that that chronically over time, urine being on those pads can irritate tissues, to say the very least. It can thin the skin and lead to infections and larger problems. I don't, want, I don't mean to, that sound, to sound too scary, but the answer is yes. It can, it can definitely cause acute and long-term problems, and it's a big reason, it's one of the many reasons to try to get these things fixed. So um, you had mentioned uh, that some of this may be caused by uh, the reduction in estrogen. Sometimes that's caused by uh, treatments with cancers. True. Uh, is there a way around that? Well, the, it does depend on the cancer situation. Um, you know. Obviously, there's a lot of different ways that shows up. One of the most common one in women is the issue of breast cancer. And it, it, one example of the way that we, that we really run into a difficult problem with this is that if women have receptor-positive breast cancer, where we're worried about giving them extra estrogen uh, due to their cancer, then we sometimes run into a lot of difficulty and confusion about how to give those women estrogen back if they've had chemo and are no longer have their normal estrogen levels. There, one small thing about that is that vaginal estrogen, the systemic absorption of vaginal estrogen is so low that a lot of oncologists, even in those types of situations, are comfortable with those patients using vaginal estrogen. So even in the really tricky times, we can often use vaginal estrogen in a way that helps. Um, but there, the answer is there are, there are other situations where we lose estrogen, and it is, I think, always valuable to think about how we can safely add it back. Okay. Um, so you had mentioned that sugar is sometimes an irritant. Um, and Always. We, and, yeah. <laughs> and so we uh, have some sugar substitutes in the form of stevia, right. uh, erythritol. <clears throat> uh, erythritol. Yeah. Yes. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. I, I, so I've looked at this myself recently because I get this question a lot. There, there is not good published data, that I, this is just the dorky scientist in me talking, about stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, all, allulose, a lot of these new calorie-free sweeteners. There, I, there's not good published data about how those relate to bladder overactivity. There is good data about the rest of them, sucralose and whatever, all those typical ones. So I'm, I worry that they are adding to that. So I, I do think that falls into the same category of something that's just worth a little detective work and seeing if it, if it changes things for you. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about recovery time after surgery? Yeah. So these, because the surgeries are done vaginally, I, I know vaginal surgery probably sounds quite odd to people, but... Without incisions on your belly and a surgery that's done vaginally, the amount of pain that we have from these surgeries is much less than other abdominal surgeries. And what we have then is usually a one night stay in the hospital and being able to go home the next morning. A lot of patients have these surgeries and, and don't need any narcotics afterwards at all. They don't take any. They just take ibuprofen and Tylenol. And after going home the first day, what I tell people to expect is that <clears throat> you really have less restrictions than you might think, and I think you're going to be able to be more active than you would expect. But day by day, even within that first week, you are going to be able to move around your house. You can do stairs. You can do a lot of normal life. And I think you're going to feel better and better every day. The amount of time that you're just on the couch and needing a lot of help from these surgeries is almost none. And when I see patients at two weeks, 
is the first time that we often check in after these surgeries. Most people are really quite surprised on how good they feel. They're asking if they can hike, if they can go on longer walks. Um, and the next time we touch base is at six weeks, and most patients have long forgotten about the surgery at six weeks. So I think there's less pain and a quicker recovery than most people expect. Surgery is a big deal. I don't mean to act like it's nothing, but I think most people are usually impressed by the experience. Thank you very much. Yep. We sure appreciate it. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. Again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccination. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.